Hello. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am super uh, s- stoked that we are here in church today. Uh, I'm super grateful that uh, we have the, uh, uh, I'm talking, I don't, uh, there's nothing else I can do on my end. Am I on? No? Yes? No? All right. I'll talk to you guys. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am super stoked that we get to be in church today. Uh, I'm going to yell a little bit loud for a second. Hold on. Oh, now I'm on. Thank you. All right. Perfect. So uh, I am just want to give you guys a few announcements as we get started, and we're going to pray here before we sing. Um, I want to remind you guys uh, that uh, yeah, Pastor's going to mention this here in a second, but as many of you guys saw already, uh, Brother Philip Wilde and his wife Rachel are here uh, with their sons again, and uh, we're super grateful for that. So uh, he's going to be preaching today, and we are Looking forward to hearing from him. I heard him in the first service, and it was a huge blessing. So uh, uh, buckle up, okay? Um, So I want to say thank you uh, to all of you guys who gave something to the uh, prom donation drive. Uh, We we received a bunch of uh, gifts and and, uh, ties and dresses and things like that, and that's going to go directly to those kids uh, to help them at the public schools. You guys did a great job with that. Thank you for everybody who took part there. I want to remind you guys, we do have a Passover Seder coming up April 27th uh, at 1 p.m. There is still a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. Uh, we, we need some help with like some potluck things or whatever, but if you, even if you don't sign up for the potluck, don't worry about that. RSVP there, and uh, uh, if you've never experienced the Passover Seder, if you're like me, uh, come, okay? And it, it'll be a wonderful experience, and uh, you can uh, invite a friend and do, uh, do what you can there. Um, we are going to be having a uh, baptism service on April 28th, okay? And so um, if you are here and you've made a decision to trust Christ as your personal Savior, but you haven't taken that next step to follow the Lord and believers' baptism, uh, we sign up, and, uh, and we want to talk to you about that. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does it look like? And what are, what are your next steps? So uh, come talk with me. Come talk with Pastor, and we would uh, love to help you take that next step. Last announcement before we pray is uh, we really need help uh, from some men in our church with security needs uh, and ushering and just to be uh, available, right? You don't need to be, uh, you know, the the biggest, strongest guy around, but uh, we need guys that are willing and available to help us with security and ushering. I'll tell you, Friday night, uh, we had uh, had some security issues, and, uh, you know, I've, I've asked multiple times, like, for help from guys, and praise the Lord, a few guys had stepped up, and so it was good we had guys here because uh, we had a guy come in on three separate times, and uh, literally came in the side gate and did, like, other things, seemingly, um, and uh, it, was a, it was a problem, but it worked out because we had men here, and, uh, and we were able to escort him out and uh, show him the door a couple times and, and all these things, and so... Uh, we need help, right? It's uh, unfortunately, as we know, we live in a crazy world. Uh, we need guys to be able to do that. So uh, we're gonna have a meeting one Sunday in May. If you're interested, again, come talk with me. Come talk with Pastor, and we wanna uh, we wanna let you know about those dates. So uh, that's it as far as my announcements today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pray and get started with our service. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to come here and uh, freely um, just talk about the Lord Jesus and and pray in in Jesus' name. And God, thank you now that we get to come before you, Lord, as children and and, uh, make our requests known. God, I do pray for um, these services today, Lord, that we would be able to draw nigh to you, Lord, and that you would draw nigh to us. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts as we sing these songs to hear your word. God, and I pray that we would, um, Lord, be more the Christians that you've called us to be as a result of what we hear today. God, that we would have some practical takeaways, Lord, that um, we would be able to more effectively serve you with our lives. God, I pray that you would just bless in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise to our feet and praise the Lord. Let's sing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. 
I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I have. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad, glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeem me for his own. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is in. To keep that which I have unto him against the day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noon, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. Amen. Simply trusting every day, trusting through the stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever before. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing if my way is clear. Praying if the path be drear. If in danger for him call. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever before. 
trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting Him while life shall last. Trusting Him till earth be past. Till within the jasper wall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by. Trusting Him, whatever befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. We have some believers here today. I'm happy to see that. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. That bought with blood wholeheartedly. Keep singing. My soul undeserving. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so the cross age to age and hour by hour the dead are raised the sinner saved the work of your power God you're so good God sing that again. God, you're so good. saved in Jesus name highly favored anointed and filled with your power for the glory of Jesus name and should this love bring suffering Lord I will remember What Calvary has brought for me, both now and forever. You're so good. God, you're so good. God. Ah, you're 
so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. Father God, there is none like you. There is none beside you. There will never be another, Lord. We bow ourselves to you today in worship and praise, Lord, admiring the works of your glory, Lord, being comforted by them and comforted by you alone, your word and your mercy, Lord, which is exemplified in Christ Jesus on the cross. And because he lives, Lord, and because you have given him all power, Lord, in heaven and in earth, Lord, we are comforted by your rod and your staff this day, Lord, and forever will we be, Lord. We thank you for the sinner, Lord, that you have sent into our midst. We pray for their repentance and faith in you, Lord, to be able to say to you in the day of days, Lord, and to give you praise when you return. We thank you and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. All right. Good morning. Hey, we're really glad. How many of you can say today God has been so good to you? Amen. Amen. And uh, we need to be thankful, always rejoice, and give God thanks and praise. He certainly deserves that. Uh, a couple of quick announcements today um, to add on to uh, what uh, Brother James mentioned earlier. Last Sunday, um, we mentioned that one of our missionaries, Johannes Katina, um, had a need. He uh, and his family are in Zambia, and they had a need uh, to... Uh, build their fence around their ministry compound another four or five feet higher because of vandalism and thievery. So they needed $750 to do that, and our children gave $300. And so last week, uh, our adults went ahead and finished it. And so uh, the check went out. He uh, um, sent me an email last night to say, please thank the church. And I know some of you had a part in that. So thank you for making that possible and I'm glad that we can help not only monthly uh, with uh, some financial uh, commitments, but we're able to help with projects. And so I just wanted to update you and to say thank you for that. Uh, we're going to uh, pray here in just a moment. Um, I want to remind you to be faithful today to give. If you uh, are a regular attender here, this is your church home. Uh, giving is an act of worship. And I want to encourage you to do that. You can do that in different platforms, different ways. Uh, we have offering boxes here uh, online. You can text uh, whatever you want to do and however you want that to happen. But when you give, make sure you do so out of a heart of gratitude, out of a heart of thanksgiving and worship to the Lord. Uh, we're to be generous people because we serve a generous God. And so uh, it's a part of worship. So I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, thank you for being faithful in your giving. If you're visiting, thank you for being here today. We're always super grateful to have people visiting with us. And so make sure before the service is over that you get by the Welcome Center. And uh, we would love the opportunity to meet uh, with you uh, as well. And I hope that you'll enjoy your time today. Also, if you're not plugged into a small group, uh, I would encourage you to, if your schedule allows, get involved. We've got groups all throughout the week. Uh, we have a group on Sunday afternoon. If Sunday's your only day, we have a group early Sunday morning at 9.15, a discipleship class. We have men's class. We've got uh, 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 adult classes. We've got classes throughout the week. So if you would like to study the Bible in a more personal setting, you could ask some questions. Maybe you're a one-on-one -on -one kind of person. Uh, we have discipleship ministries where we pair you up with someone. And so there's a lot of opportunities. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that if possible. And uh, if you're not growing spiritually, if I'm not growing, it, it's nobody's fault but our own faults. And so I want to encourage you to be a part and uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, today, when we go to prayer, we want to remember to pray for the, the nation of Israel. And uh, they are under attack. Um, somebody asked me this week, why are uh, the Jewish people, why is Israel hated by everybody, it seems, around the world? And uh, without going into a long diatribe, but the reality is it's a spiritual thing. And uh, God uh, made a nation out of Abraham, and he said this people, this nation, this group, the Jewish people, are going to be a light to the world. They're going to tell the world about me. Are they perfect? Not at all. As a matter of fact, for many of them, they've turned their back on their true Messiah, on Jesus. But God made some promises. Uh, I was reading in my devotions this morning, even Psalm 124, where David said, if the Lord had not been on our side, 
wow, if God had not taken care of us, and he would end that psalm by saying, you know, our help comes in the name of the Lord. And so uh, God will keep his promises. He has a long record of keeping his promises. So, uh, but it doesn't mean it's not been difficult. So they are obviously still uh, in a battle to defend their southern border. Uh, they're still trying to rescue hostages, some of whom are American uh, from Hamas. And now they're getting attacked from the east. Uh, Iran has been sending drone missiles. And so uh, we need to pray for their leadership. And then we need to pray for our leadership here. Uh, the principle is very true. Genesis 12, God said, I will bless them that bless Israel. I will curse them that curse Israel. So uh, we would do very poorly, and it would not be wise for us to turn our back on Israel. So uh, we need to pray for them today. And we pray that God will use this to open people's eyes and people will realize who their Savior really is. And so uh, you join with me in praying for them today. Uh, continue to pray for Debbie. She was here in the first service and be praying for her uh, and Anthony's recent home going. The young lady, Tasha, who had really a flesh-eating disease, she, believe it or not, she's stabilizing, a uh, long process, but uh, continue to keep her in prayer if you would do that. How many of you have a burden, a request, something you're praying about? Okay, God knows what they are. I'm glad he can handle that workload. And so we're going to pray today, and then we're going to introduce our speaker and uh, we'll dismiss our teens here in a moment. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. We're really grateful that uh, we can worship you today. This is the day that you have made, and we are to rejoice and be glad in it. So, Lord, that's what we want to do today. And, Lord, a lot of hands were raised. Um, we know that everybody we meet is fighting some kind of a battle. We understand that. So, Lord, help us today to recenter and refocus on you. It's one of the reasons why we come as we worship you. Uh, you're worthy of it, but it helps us to center our life uh, on you. And we know if you're in the right place in our life, then everything else will fall into right place. So today, Lord, these problems, these burdens, these issues, I pray that we'll put them in your hands, cast them on you, and we're told you care for us. And so, Lord, I pray whatever these needs may be, health or direction and guidance or provision, you know what they, uh, th these needs are. I pray that in your timing, in your way, you'll lead and guide. We know you will. Help us to trust you and help us to follow you, Lord, uh, uh, knowing that you'll never make a mistake with us, and I pray that you'd help our faith. Lord, we want to pray for Israel today, and we pray for the leadership there. Lord, uh, pray you grant wisdom, and Lord, uh, as we have been praying through, through these last several months for this country, there are many, Lord, who don't know you. They, um, they have a God of their own making, but... Uh, Lord, many do not know that you came and you fulfilled all the law and you fulfilled, the Lord, the prophecy regarding the Messiah. And uh, Lord, they need a savior. And so we pray that through what is happening, you would cause people to uh, search the scriptures, to ask those questions and spiritually, Lord, come to faith in you. We would pray for that, pray for revival in that country. We pray that you would grant wisdom, protection, Lord, on the world stage, all the, the, the Middle Eastern countries and even around the world, that you would show yourself strong, that people would see absolutely that there is a God, and that, Lord, uh, they would be forced to glorify you. That's our prayer. We pray for our country, our president, our leadership, Lord, not to make foolish decisions, not to be weak, but to stand for what's right. Help us to pray for them, and Lord, we pray that uh, our country would would uh, always be a supporter of the nation of Israel. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us um, to just pray as we should and trust you in, in, in these matters. Lord, we pray for Debbie. We pray for Tasha. We pray for, for those battling illnesses. Good to see some folks back today. Lord, I uh, pray you bless our guests and uh, let them be encouraged. We pray for our offering today, Lord, as folks give, that they'll give out of a heart full of gratitude and uh, out of worship to you and bless what's given here and around the world. Lord, we're just thankful uh, for the privilege to be able to worship you today. You have been so good to us. So Lord, as we uh, prepare to open your word uh, today, speak to our hearts, help us to focus our minds. Uh, Lord, bless the kids' classes and all that are the events taking place today, we pray. And we'll be sure to thank you and praise you for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I guess teen class. All right, teens, you are dismissed. And uh, we are very grateful today to have a very special guest with us. And uh, he is no stranger to most of us. 
but if you are visiting here today, he will introduce himself uh, to you here momentarily, uh, and that is Brother Philip Wild. And Brother Philip and his wife Rachel are here, the boys are here, even their new addition, uh, little Luke, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to see them. And uh, the Wilds, as many of you know, um, we were blessed to have them serve alongside us the last few years, and uh, God called them to go overseas. And so we kind of uh, said our big goodbyes uh, a few months ago, but uh, things have moved, and he'll talk about that pretty rapidly, and uh, they were able to get visas, and uh, this will be probably their last time here on the East Coast, and so since they were here, um, uh, I uh, certainly said, please come today and give us one more opportunity to hear them, uh, see them, and uh, to uh, just uh, wish them well and pray for them, and which we'll do at the end of the service today. And uh, so uh, be praying. It's moving quickly. And in a matter of, uh, I think, a few days, they're on their way. So we're really glad that uh, Philip is w with us today and Rachel and the family. And so uh, we're going to have him come without any further ado. He's going to preach today, all right? So let's give him a big hand today. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, it's a blessing to be here, and uh, we're so excited to be able to be back for a little short uh, cup of coffee. Ringing, ringing. Are we good? Yep. All right. Got a good staff back there. So, anyways, uh, most of you know us, the wild people, and uh, still. Good? Okay, okay. I'm told to keep going, so I'm going to keep going. Anyways, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you so much, uh, church, uh, Pastor Schaefer. Really last minute, uh, just message saying, hey, you know, we're going to be up your way, sort of, kind of, and, uh, you know, these are a couple dates we have. I'd like to come by and see you guys if you could, and that was my thought, just come by and see you guys, let's see the baby, but he asked me to preach, so that's a blessing, I thank you for that. And uh, church, thank you so much for just all that you have done for our family, just the blessing you've been. Um, I wanted to personally say that, um, obviously what was done back in November, but just the continued prayer. Uh, it's just a real blessing and encouragement, and uh, we, we, we haven't forgotten that, and we never will forget that by God's grace. And uh, you folks, so many of you have touched our lives and uh, have uh, just, you know, <laughs> we left, and in the, in the days since our leaving, our boys, um, kind of breaks your heart, kind of rips your heart out when your boys ask, so are we going to go see so-and-so this week? Are we going to go see so-and-so? I want to see my friends. I want to see so-and-so at church. And it's to talk about the people here. And not just kids. Our boys consider the adults their friends as well. So um, uh, it's, it's truly, it's, it's hard in ways to say goodbye. I praise God for heaven where we won't ever have to say goodbye. And we'll, there will be no departing. But, uh, you know, God's will is just that. It's God's will. And the speed at which he has facilitated our departure is almost in some ways mind-numbing. We just sit back and almost kind of like on a roller coaster, you know, you're just holding on for dear life. It's been a whirlwind. Um, you know, there was no reason why our visas should have been approved as fast as they were, especially in light of the fact that they're in the midst of holiday. But we get an email message at 9 o'clock Monday night, your visas are approved. I didn't even know you were open. And so there were three, holiday, three, three more days of holiday, and I couldn't. We couldn't get to the embassy to pick it up because they were closed. And Friday, we picked up our visas, and uh, you know, we already had plane tickets because we got the email saying that your visas were approved. So plane tickets are purchased, and by God's grace, we're flying out at 1 o'clock, 1.20 in the morning, Thursday morning uh, in two weeks. So not this Thursday, but next Thursday. So pray for us. Uh, we're flying over to that place over there. I won't say the name uh, for sake of our online problem makers that may be there. But, uh, you know, God is greater, isn't he? And so, you know, we try to do our due diligence, but God is going to protect. He's going to take care. And we're excited. There's a big need over there. And uh, pray, for, pray with us as we go over, Lord willing, and we're looking to learn language. That's a very important aspect. Those of you who English is not your first language, you understand, or maybe it is, but you've learned a second language, you understand what it takes to learn another language. It's not easy, but 
You know, God is the giver of language, and we're trusting him for that. And so pray with us as we endeavor to learn language, as we endeavor to make contacts with people. Um, so, you know, God, God is, this is all God's thing. You know, this is God's ministry. And, uh, you know, we didn't, it was out of the blue that God called us. It wasn't out of the blue for him. But he led us to where he was leading us. And then the speed at which he's done this. So it's God's thing. We're just along for the ride, so we're trusting him for that. But it's good to be here. Thank you so much. And again, um, we love you in the Lord. And uh, what God is doing, I heard about what the kids had downstairs a couple weeks ago on Resurrection Sunday, over 60. Great day here, over 300, I think you said. And that does our heart well. And I jokingly joked with Pastor Schaefer, I said, yeah, we just had to leave. That's all it was, you know. <laughs> Get the... No, I'm joking, of course. But uh, no, it's a blessing to see God work and God using and God still reaching people. I think a lady got saved that Sunday, and that's just a blessing. Praise God for that. And uh, so with no further um, remarks, let's get into the Word of God. You know, between the worship and something that you mentioned in prayer, Pastor Schaefer, a thought came to mind. They kind of go together. I wonder sometimes, do even we as believers, you're talking about the Jewish people having a God of their own making. And I wonder sometimes, do we have a God of our own making? Do we have thoughts and conjure up ideas and expectations of God that are not biblical, but in our own culture and our own feelings and our own desires? And on the heels of that, with the, with the, with the song service, one of the songs, I believe, is the, is the third one, may have been the fourth, but God is so good. If we were honest, is there ever a time where it's a little hard to agree with that? Maybe things are going in our life, they're going just wrong, as we would say, wrong. And it's a struggle for us to say God is so good because we look at the situations and what we are going through and we say, yeah, I know God's good, but we really, we're struggling a little bit. We have a little bit of a catch doesn't change the fact he's good. He is good. But what we're going through, and I think they go hand in hand sometimes. We have a God of our own making. You know, God is good. He is right. He does what's best. So we're going to look at today, turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 11. We're going to talk about emergencies today. Emergencies. It was shortly before we left. We were, I think, on 100 and it was on Jamaica Avenue and 104th or something like that. We were turning to go home, and it was all blocked off because there was an emergency situation. Fire squad was there, ambulance was there, everything was there, and the guys were getting out with their gear, and they were going up to one of the houses, and the man comes out sheepishly and is shaking his head, saying there's nothing. False alarm. I mean, an emergency was there, and they were ready. The response team was ready. They were there to meet the need of the emergency and the man comes out and just, you could see the shame all over his face. You could see just that feeling of embarrassment all over his face because, false alarm, the emergency wasn't as big as it, as it seemed to be. And usually that, you know, that's best case scenario. Usually it's the other way around where emergency isn't in fact an emergency. We've all had emergency situations, haven't we? We know what that's like. We, we've experienced that. Hopefully it's not too life-threatening, but we know, what that, we know what, that, what that entails. Have you ever really needed to get somewhere fast? Late for a doctor's appointment, late for work, late for dropping your kids off from school, whatever the case may be, and it seemed like no one else had the same sense of urgency that you had, and everyone else was dawdling, and everyone else was taking their time. They wouldn't get out of the way like they normally would, and they, 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 would, they didn't sense your same sense of urgency, and they were just in your way. Ever experienced that? Here in New York? Yeah, of course. And since I have left New York, I deal with those emotions quite frequently in the rest of the continental U.S., because I have come to accustom the wonderful driving here, and that's, yeah, you just, you, you went in Rome, drive like Romans, and uh, I drive like Rome. 
And so it's like people out there, they don't drive that way. They don't merge. It takes them 10 minutes to figure out if they want to merge or not. It's like, come on, get going. Like, we don't have all day. You know, emergencies, urgency. We, we, we have something we got to get to, something that needs to be done fast, and other people don't sense it. Emergencies. Those of you who have kids or have raised kids, you know what it's like to have to go somewhere. Maybe it's Sunday morning, and it seems like five minutes before it's time to leave, what happens? Everything just blows up, right? You ever been there? Everything just blows up. All of a sudden, the meltdown starts. Nathaniel, his thing is shoes. He has to have his shoes super tight. And if he can feel any wiggle in his shoe whatsoever, it's meltdown central. Fighting, emergency potty needs, all of a sudden, you just went potty four times. Why do you need to go to potty again? I got to go potty, you know. I got to go to church. Come on, we got to go emergencies and it seems like you know the children don't their emergencies are the most important and they don't sense the need for the parents emergency the parents have emergencies children have emergencies many times at the same time and it's like come on your emergency can wait my emergency is more important the children feel that parents feel that and it goes back and forth neither appreciate one another but sometimes i wonder is that how we are with god you know god he doesn't have any emergencies per se, but there are things that he looks at and says, you know what, this is what I deem as urgent. This is what I deem as most important. This is what I see as needful. And we're sitting there with our emergencies and we're wondering, God, I have this I need you to do. I have that I need you to do. I come to you and I beg you and I implore, please help me, please come through. And God it just seems like he's taking his time. It seems like he's that slow driver in front of us. They just won't get out of the way or won't assist. Ever feel that way? I've been there. If we're honest, we can feel this way about God in regard to his response to our need, our prayer, our emergency. We feel like, God, you, you don't find this important. You're not answering in the speed and in the way that I want you to answer. In the way that I perceive. I perceive this as important, as needful, and it, it very well may be. But we're sensing that he doesn't find the importance, and so we get a little frustrated that he's not moving as fast as we think he should. And the key word is perception, perceive. God sees things differently, and we understand that. And it's easy for us to go to somebody else and say, you know what, hey, God is seldom early, but never late, right? We know that. We understand that. We say that. God is seldom early, but never late. Hey, don't worry. Don't lose faith. God's going to work it out. God's going to take care. And it's easy for us to talk to other people in that way. But when it, the shoe's on our foot and we're having our need, we get it. it's, a little, it's a little different, isn't it? Sometimes we don't take seriously or have an urgency about what God says of a great importance. We're like the kids. You know, the kids say, you know, I, I, I want my juice and my candy now. I got to have it now. It's so important. My sucker, my sucker, come on, I got to have it right now. Or say, no, later, Nate, you need to eat your, you need your good food. You need, that's important. No, oh, good food's not important. I want my sucker. I want my sucker. Right? The kid is the sucker's most important. The parents say, no, you need to eat your good bites. You need to eat your good food. We're not speaking the same language. And God is saying, you know, there's some things that are very important you need to do. And we're getting all cross and upset because God won't take care of our sucker. Has it ever seemed that you had an urgent need and maybe an emergency and God just takes his time? We've all been there. Why? It almost seems as if our emergency situation is not an emergency to God. God, don't you see how important this is? Don't you see? I need you to answer right now. And the answer is wait. It can be very frustrating. If we're honest, it can be very frustrating, very trying. We feel the pressure of the situation. We feel the mountain. It's looming. It feels like the walls are closing in. Our back's up against the proverbial wall, and we think, I got to have an answer. I got to have a way of escape now. And we're looking around, there's no escape. And we're praying, and we're seeking God, and nothing. Seemingly nothing. Again, perception. We're perceiving that there's no answer. We're perceiving that God's not hearing. We're perceiving that he doesn't care. It's all perception. 
John chapter 11, if you will. We have a group of siblings that are dealing a very familiar passage that are dealing very much with this situation. An emergency. An emergency has come in their life. A very real emergency. The Bible says in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick. Now obviously there are some sicknesses that are not necessarily an emergency. They're just something that has to run its course. But even in like a cold or a flu, even in those... It can be an emergency situation depending on the person. It may be life or death depending on the health situation. But this was a legitimate, real emergency. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany of the town of Mary and her sister Martha. You have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. These three loved Jesus very much. They followed you. They're very close friends to Jesus. Spent much time with Jesus, cared about Jesus, and Jesus cared about them. It was reciprocated. They had a close bond amongst themselves. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So the situation is Lazarus is sick, and we know, the, we know the account, and Lazarus is sick, and he's close to death, and it's a very serious situation. It's an emergency, and they send some help to go find Jesus, to have him to come, to request him to come. And of course, we know, verse 6, it says, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. That doesn't compute Wait a minute, Lord, you, you hear about this emergency situation, you hear about this need, and yet you're going to delay two days. Two days. It almost sounds cruel. It almost seems harsh. If we did that with our own flesh and blood, if, if my child had a need, and I didn't immediately take care of that need, I would be de deemed as neglectful, wouldn't I? And yet the Lord delays. Is he neglectful? He has the power to help. On the surface, he seems neglectful. On the surface, it seems like he's harsh. On the surface, it seems like he's cruel to wait. We know the rest of the story. But if we put ourselves in their situation, we put ourselves where they are and go through it with them without knowing the end, we would act in the very same way, I'm sure. We have an emergency situation here. Mary and Martha do the right thing. We know the Lord's not neglectful. We know he's not harsh. We know he has a purpose in it all. And Mary and Martha are doing the right thing. They have this emergency situation. What do they do? They come immediately to Jesus. Verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Hey, Jesus, you love Lazarus, you love us, we have need. One that you love is sick. We know the Lord loves the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the whole world. But those who are his children, his love may be a little bit deeper. And he loves Lazarus. He loves Mary. He loves Martha. And the sisters and Lazarus knows that. I wonder what Lazarus was thinking as he's, that word is gone and he's sitting there and he's waiting. I wonder when Jesus is going to come. I wonder when Jesus is going to come. Is he going to come? And one day goes by and his health is deteriorating more and more and eventually he dies. We focus on the sisters, but I wonder how Lazarus was feeling going through all of that. We don't know. Emergencies. Why does it happen that way? Why is it the Lord worked that way? We don't know. That's above our pay grade. But I believe there are some things that we can, practical things that we can pull out of this passage that can help us to understand why our emergencies, what we perceive as emergency, and many times they are real, true emergencies, why they are not always emergencies to God.
Do we understand that God doesn't have any emergencies? Nothing is an emergency to God. He sees the end from the beginning. He already has it all worked out. He already knows what he's going to do. He already has the plan in place. He already, he allowed it to happen. And he has a reason for it all. But these are things to help us. There's a reason why God does what he does. We're going to look at that. John chapter 11, let's, let's look at verse 4. The Bible says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. The first thing that we can pull from this and we can look at and see is that our emergencies are not always as serious or as dire as they seem to be. What we're going through and the struggle that we're going through and what we perceive and think as an emergency, and it may very well be, and it probably is, we understand it's not as dire or as serious as it, is, as it seems to be. It's all a matter of perspective. It's all a matter of vantage point. We're looking at things from this angle and from, from this point of view, and we are limited in how we look at and how we see and how far we can see, but God sees the whole picture. And he looks at it and says, it's not an emergency. That little child who can't get his sucker right now the parent knows he's going to give the sucker to him here in a little bit, but the child doesn't know that. And they're so worked up and so frantic, they can't even reason to hear that he's going to get it in a few minutes. And how often that's how we are. We're so worked up and so frazzled and so just distraught that we can't even hear the voice of God. We can't even hear what God is saying because we're so frantic. Understandably so. But our emergencies are not always as dire as they seem. They're dire to us. They're serious to us. They're troublesome to us. It's an impossible situation to us. We look at it and we say, I can't figure it out. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what we're going to do. It's overwhelming to us. This, this process of going overseas for us, we've been overseas. But this, where we're going, is a little different. We don't have any real, any, a lot of contacts. We don't know the language. There's, there's some overwhelm. But that doesn't take God by surprise. It caused Mary and Martha and Lazarus, no doubt, some real worry and fret. I mean, who sits there and is ready to die? I wonder how, again, how Lazarus was feeling in this. It's very real. An emergency. They go to Jesus and say, Jesus, we need you to help us right now. Right now. And he says, okay. He's not going to die. What does he say in verse 4? He says, this sickness is not unto death. They're like, no, no, you don't understand, Jesus. He's going to die. And he says, no, he's not going to die. He's not going to. It's not serious. Chill out. It's okay. I got this. You don't get it, Lord. He's going to die. It's kind of like, the, it's kind of like the, the disciples. They're on the Sea of Galilee. And we're going to die. We're going to perish. And he says, don't you have any faith? I told you we're going to the other side. If I told you we're going to the other side, we're going to go to the other side. Why are you panicked about it? And he tells them, they're not going to die. Lazarus isn't going to die. Don't worry about it. He's not being, he's not being insensitive here. He's, he's just stating fact. He's not going to die. And we know the, we know the rest of the story. But how, how just off the wall would that comment be? I mean, put, put ourselves in that situation. We hear that, or that message comes back to us, and we're thinking... What do you mean he's not going to die? Especially day one goes by, day two goes by, and then Lazarus dies. What would that do to our faith? He's not trying to be insensitive. He's, but we understand God doesn't get bent out of shape because we have an emergency. He knows what he's going to do. Jesus knew what he was going to do. It wasn't as serious as Mary and Martha thought it was. It doesn't mean it wasn't serious. It's just in vantage, in comparison to God and what God is going to do, it's not serious. It's not serious. Number two, second thing we need to remember, we can, we, can, we can put away in our mind. And Let's look at verse 4 again. It says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but 
It is for something. This sickness, there is a reason for this sickness. It's not for death. But there is a reason. But for the glory of God. That the Son of God might be glorified thereby. There is a reason for it, and it's so that the Son of God is glorified. So that God is glorified. So glory comes to God. We all want God to be glorified, don't we? We all want God to be praised, don't we? As long as it doesn't hurt too bad. As long as we can handle it. See, our emergencies, we have to understand, our emergencies are not always allowed for the reason we think. They have an emergency here, and the emergency is going to get even more dire when Lazarus dies. And I'm sure Mary and Martha are sitting there just biting their fingernails, figuring out, trying to figure out why this happened. Why is Jesus not coming? What is the reason here? Why, 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 why? And we get so frantic. So many times we think maybe God's coming after us. Maybe there's something wrong I've done. Maybe I'm not doing what I ought to do. Maybe, maybe there's sin in my life. Maybe, and we go through all this litany of questioning, trying to figure out why. Or we, we look at somebody else's life and we go through the whole figuring out, okay, maybe this, maybe that. How'd that get Job and his friends? Read after chapter after chapter after chapter of Job going through all this questioning by his friends. Well, maybe it's this, maybe Job, maybe, maybe you're sin in sin. Maybe this is happening, maybe that is happening. And none of it was right, none of it was true. None of it. They had all their reasons, they had all their assumptions, they had all their accusations. And all they did was hurt Job. And God was upset with them because of their accusations. They didn't know. There was no way they could know. We, know. we know that God was teaching Satan a lesson. We don't know why God allows emergencies in our life. We don't know why things happen. You know, sometimes it's to teach us, to correct us. Sometimes it's to redirect us, to get us to go a different way. Sometimes it's for us to reach others. If we hadn't gone through this emergency, we wouldn't have been able to reach that person with the gospel. God has a reason. Sometimes it's to teach others. Other people watch how we deal with things, how we go through life, and how we deal with the situation, and they're able to be admonished and encouraged and taught through our life. Sometimes it's to teach us. Sometimes it's to prepare us for a greater work. We want God to use us. We want God to, to use our life, and God knows that we're not ready for what he has in store, so he allows us to go through some emergencies to prepare us for the greater work. Sometimes it's to enable us to handle bigger and difficult, bigger problems and difficulties down the road. Oh, isn't that encouraging? I get to go through this problem right now because God has a bigger problem for me later. Ooh, it makes me just want to shout, right? No. But sometimes that's the purpose. God knows I can't handle that big problem down the road because I'm not ready for it. I have to go through this. You never get to algebra and pre-calculus and calculus until you learn how to do one plus one and two plus two. And for the person learning that, for the little child learning one plus one and two plus two, that's hard. That's hard. Sometimes it's because we need to have our faith in God to grow. Sometimes, sometimes. And I could go on and on and on and we could conjecture and talk about all the sometimes and all the reasons for why emergencies come. Well, we don't know. God knows. It's above our pay grade to figure it all out. It's not meant for us to figure it all out. Aren't you glad you don't know what's going to happen five and ten years down the road? I'd run scared. I'd run scared. But God knows, and he knows what is necessary to get me there and to get you there. And so he allows things in our life to get us there. Because he's gracious and he's patient and he leads us along slowly and softly. We spend so much time worrying ourselves sick trying to figure out the why. Just leave that with him. Leave it with him. Mary and Martha didn't know the reason why, but the Lord tells us the reason why. It's simply so that God is glorified. 
The disciples had a problem with this in John chapter 9 when there was a blind man and the blind man sitting there and the blind man needs to be healed and the, and the, and the, and the, and the disciples said, who sinned? Was it, was it the blind man? Did he sin or was it his parents? And Jesus said, no, nobody sinned. It's simply so that, you know, my works are manifested or made known and so that everyone realizes slowly that I'm the one, that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the one that comes to save the, save the world. God has a reason for what he does, and we know that. But as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, it's important, and it would be negligent for him not to remind the reader of the things that they already know. We know these things, but we need to be reminded. Number three... Number three, why are emergencies that we deem emergencies not always emergencies to God? What are some things we can gather? Let's look at verse 5, John chapter 11, verse 5. The Bible says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them. Often when we're going through the difficulty and we're going through the emergency, sometimes we begin to question the love of God. God really loved me. We know God loves us, but we're struggling, experiencing and feeling it. And we have to be careful with our feelings. Our feelings can be swayed. We need to trust truth. The truth of God's word doesn't change. Truth is truth whether we feel it or not. Nothing can change truth. It doesn't matter if I believe this or not, it's true. It doesn't matter if I feel it or not, it's true. God's word is true. And the truth was, whether Martha believed it, whether Lazarus believed it, whether Mary believed it, whether they felt it, it doesn't matter. The Bible says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Truth. Truth. Yes. A God of love does allow emergencies to happen. Point number three. God does allow it. How could a God of love allow, and you fill in the blank, we've heard it all. I don't understand how a God who really said, he says he loves us, how could he allow that earthquake to happen? How could he allow that war to happen? How could he allow that person to die? How could he allow, how could, how, 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 how? We hear the lost world asking these questions all the time, but it's not just the lost world. Many times Christians ask these very same questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't get it. He's just a good person. He had to, I mean, why did he have to deal with that? And that, and, and that person who's a scoundrel, doesn't it, nothing happens. My response to that is, is anyone really good? In biblical terms, why do bad things happen to good people? Are there really any good people, biblically speaking? The Bible says in Jeremiah that my heart is deceitfully and desperately wicked above all things. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. We're not good. I'm not good. There's nothing outside of Jesus Christ. There's nothing good about Brother Philip. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I don't deserve anything good outside of hell. That's the only thing I deserve. By the way, I still deserve hell. Even though I'm blood-bought, even though I'm washed in the blood and praise God for that, I still deserve hell. But because of his mercy and because of his applied righteousness, praise be to God. A better question would be, why does good things happen to bad people? Why does good things happen to any of us? Why does anything good happen? Why, why was I allowed to have another breath? Why was I allowed, praise God, for our children? Why did God bless me with another child? It's a good thing. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve anything. But God is good. And he's good not because I deserve it, not because I am good, but because he's good. That's who he is. We shouldn't question the love of God or the wisdom of God. But we do, don't we? 
It's dangerous for us to go down that road of questioning. God, why, why? Not that it's wrong in a sincere way. David, many times, you read the Psalms, many times he's asking God why. It's not wrong to ask God why as long as we have a right heart and a right motive behind it. Some, you know, if we're going to God in a sincere way, God, I just don't understand this. Help me to understand this. Help me, Lord, to grow in my faith. Teach me the lessons you want me to learn from this. I'm struggling with this, Lord. I'm struggling getting this. I'm struggling seeing this, but help me. I'm frail. That's different than, God, why are you doing this? I don't get this. You know, and we cross our arms. We understand the attitude. It's no different with our children. Our children are struggling with something, they have the right attitude. We are patient. We're able to be patient with it. But when they have that bad attitude, eh, you're not going to tell me what to do. We struggle with that. And correction comes. Facts are facts. God loves you and I. And his love for us is because of who he is, not because we're wonderful people, as I've already said. You know, true love allows for development. Growth of the individual. True love allows for growth. Which means allowing things to happen that facilitate the growth and development is needed. You're saying, what are you getting at? My children, your children, if you have, as they grow, as they develop, they have to do some things that might be, there might be a little bit of possibility of them getting a little hurt just for their development. And I'll illustrate my children eventually have to learn to walk up the stairs. They have to learn first to take their first steps. And you know as well as I do that they take those first steps, they're going to stumble, they're going to fall. They ride a bike, they're going to probably skin their knee a little bit. Okay? Now, as good parents, we're, we're there, we're trying to help them, we're trying to protect them as much as we can. But it's inevitable, they're going to get some bumps and bruises. Does that mean we don't love them? No, we love them, and so we allow them to develop. We allow them to walk up the stairs, and we're there to catch them if they fall. We're there to kiss their boo-boo if they have a boo-boo. But we allow them to walk up the stairs. That's love. We allow them to develop. Love isn't necessarily, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you so that nothing ever happens to you. That may, that may look like love initially, but that, that stunts their growth. It stunts their progress. It stunts them. And God knows there's somewhere he wants us to get. There's something he wants us to become. And he knows there's things that he has to allow for us to get there, for our faith to grow, for us to become what we ought to become. And we may get some bumps and bruises along the way. But he's always there to help us through it. He's always there to pick us up. He's always there to help us get through it and to help us to recover he, he, he's not harsh. He's not cruel. He's not trying. He's not kicking us when we're down. He's not scolding us when we fall. He's there. Yes, a God of love does allow emergencies to happen, but they're for a reason. He's going to allow Lazarus to die, but it's for a reason. It's for a reason. Number four. I have to hurry. Number four, John chapter 11, verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. It's mentioned twice in this chapter that Jesus heard. Look at verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Then in verse 6, when he heard, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days. It's mentioned twice that he heard. When things are mentioned multiple times, there's a reason. God's emphasizing the fact that he heard. He heard. Our emergencies, number four, our emergencies do, emergencies do not always move the Lord to action. And here's the key, when we want action. Just because we have an emergency, just because we go to God and pray and we seek Him and we beg Him and we may even fast, it doesn't mean it's going to move Him to immediate action. But what can we hold to is the fact that He heard. He heard. It's, it's recorded here that He heard. Why? It's to admonish us and to encourage us that God does hear. God does hear. We have a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. He hears every prayer that we pray. He hears. Now, we may not always like the answer. The answer may be no. 
The answer may be wait. The answer may be yes. And when we struggle wondering, God, have you heard me? God, have you heard me? God, have you heard me? Is it really that we're struggling with the fact of God hearing? Is that really the struggle? Or is it the struggle that we are wondering if God's going to answer in the way that we want him to answer? In the way that we want him to answer. We struggle with the feeling that God isn't hearing because I believe many times we are wondering, God, are you going to answer in the time frame that I want you to answer and in the way that I want you to answer? And I believe Mary and Martha probably dealt with these same, these same feelings and frustrations. Look at verse 20, 21. 20 and 21, the, ver- the Bible says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But where's Mary? But Mary sat still in the house. So Jesus has delayed for two days. He finally makes his journey and he arrives. News gets back to Mary and Martha and Martha makes a beeline for Jesus. But Mary sits still in the house. Why was she sitting in the house? We don't know, but we can, we can, we can make assumptions. We can make some guesses. She was probably frustrated. She was probably hurt. She was probably grieving definitely over the loss of her brother, but probably with Jesus. She was probably a little frustrated with Jesus for his delay. You ever been there? Ever been a little frustrated with the Lord because it seemed like he just delayed and didn't, just took his time and didn't answer in the way that he wanted you to, that you wanted him to answer? I've been there. But notice the patience and love of Christ. He doesn't rebuke Mary and Martha. By the way, Martha is going to vocalize her frustration. Look at verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. If you would have only arrived, if you would have got here when we sent you, if you would have got here, our brother wouldn't have died. What took you so long? You sense the frustration, even the anger in her voice? The grief, the sorrow in her heart, the unbelief that is there? But then it's mixed with great faith. Look at verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. The great faith. And many times when we're going through those emergencies, we have those swings of emotion. Where we have, we do things out of great despair and great sorrow. We say things we shouldn't say and we act in a way. It doesn't doesn't mean it's right. But you notice God doesn't condone their lack of faith and he doesn't condone even their negative emotion, negative response. But he's patient. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. He doesn't rebuke them. Aren't you glad God is patient with us? Aren't you glad he's long-suffering? If we're going to be like Christ, we need to be that way with other people. We need to be patient and merciful with others. Maybe they're going through something and they respond in a way that, wow, that was kind of sharp. We don't know what they're going through. Let's be like Jesus and let's give them some grace. Number five, let's look at verse 15. Verse 15. Actually, let's pick it up in verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly. So the, the, Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick and he delays for two days and, and uh, the disciples are having a dialogue with Jesus and Jesus says that Lazarus is sleeping. And the disciples say, well, why are we going to go and wake him up if he's sleeping? Then said Jesus, verse 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Whoa, wait a minute, what did you just say? <laughs> Lazarus is dead and you're glad for our sakes that you weren't there to help him? First, Jesus is waiting two days to go and help. And now he's saying, I'm glad that I wasn't there to help him because it's for your sake. Bring that by me again? Say that again? You know, many times there are things that the Lord says in his word that just don't strike us. Right. 
Like, we have to read that again and read that again and read that again because it just doesn't make sense. How and why would a loving God say those kind of things? Because he has a purpose in it. He has a reason. He goes on. The verse doesn't end. It doesn't end there. Verse, verse 15, it says, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? To the intent that she may believe. There's a purpose for me not being there when you wanted me there. It was so that you believe. It was so that God gets the glory. Our emergencies allow for God to prove himself to us and to others. It allows us to have our faith strengthened. It allows us to grow. It allows others to see how we deal with things that come in our life and allows for others to see, wow, how did you go through that? How did you deal with that with such grace and such peace? And it gives opportunity for them to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he can do. Sometimes the emergencies that happen in our life and what we go through and what others go through, they're for the purpose of others and our own faith to grow and for God to prove himself and to show himself strong so that when we're going through a difficulty, we can look back because we've had situations where, hey, God took us through this, and 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 all these times God was faithful. And so now that we're going through this, you know what? Hey, God was faithful, faithful, faithful. God's going to be faithful. But if we don't have those things, what do we have to go on? We have his word. You may not have anything, but you know what we have is word. God's faithful. But it sure helps to have some practical experience. Sure helps. Skip a couple things here. Let's look at John 11, verse 33 to 35. John 11, 33 to 35. When Jesus, therefore, he makes his, he makes his journey, he, he arrives, it says, when Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping. Who? It was Mary. Verse 32, then when Mary was come, she finally does come where Jesus was. She finally does come and make her way to Jesus. When Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So Mary's saying the same thing Martha said. They both had the same, the same thoughts. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, And the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Does he, again, does he rebuke her for her lack of faith? Does he rebuke her for her for her her frustration with the Lord? Does he rebuke her for that? He could have, and he would have been right to do so. But he doesn't. The patience. You notice number next, whatever number we're on. Our emergencies do break the heart of our Lord. They do break his heart. Even though he knows what he's going to do. Even though he knows the end from the beginning. He he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that. But his heart was still breaking for Mary and Martha. His heart was still breaking for the Jews who were weeping. His heart was still troubled and grieved at their tears. So much so that in verse 35, actually verse 34, it says in and said, where have ye laid him? Don't you think he knew where they laid him? He knew. They said unto him, Lord, come and see. He wants to enter into their struggle, into into their problem, and he comes with them, and he walks with them, and God wants to walk on the journey that we walk. But he's asking us, hey, where have you laid him? He comes, hey, what's your trouble? What's your struggle? Are we going to pour out our heart to him, or are we going to close up in anger? I said, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The God of the universe who made all things, who's the maker and giver of life, who's the the one who ends life, he's the one who holds our life in his hand, he's weeping because of the trouble that they're dealing with. Don't ever forget that when we deal with those emergencies, he understands and he's touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He knows what we're dealing with. He understands the struggle. He knows how he's going to figure it out. He he already has it all worked out, but yet he's touched. He's touched. Our emergencies do break the heart 
of our Lord. And lastly, while our emergencies give us the opportunity to see the mighty hand of God, but lastly, our emergencies allow for God to accomplish his plan. Let's look at verse 44 and 45. 44 and 45. Jesus cried and said, he... Sorry, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 44. I got to be in the right place. And, he's, and he that was dead came forth. Actually, look at verse 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Just like Jesus said, he, this sickness is not unto death. It, it was perceived that Lazarus was going to die. He did die, but that's not the end. Jesus knew what he was going to do. But look at verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things what Jesus did believed on him. They believed on him. That's the purpose. Glory was given to God. Praise was given to God. But they believed, the Jews believed on Jesus. Why? Because they saw Lazarus raised from the dead. If Jesus had been, if he had answered in the time that Mary and Martha wanted him to answer, that would have never happened. They wanted Jesus to come now. They wanted him to come and to heal Lazarus now when he was sick. But Jesus said, no, I have a greater purpose in mind. I have a greater plan in mind. I am going to answer your prayer. I am going to heal Lazarus. He is going to live. But I have a bigger thing in mind. I have people that I want to reach. I have people that I want to believe on me. And so I'm going to let him die. I'm going to let you struggle a little bit because I have a purpose in it. It's going to seem cruel. It's going to seem harsh. But it's all going to work out in the end because I truly do love you and I truly do love these people. Our emergencies are not devoid of God's love. He has a purpose in them. He has a plan. He wants glory. He wants people to believe on him. Look at verse 42. Verse 42. And I know that thou hear, he's praying to the Lord. Let's look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. I'm doing all of this not because I, don't, I need clarification from you, Father, but I want it for them that they may believe. Emergencies often happen because, simply because God wants to receive the glory and he's working his plan. Emergencies. We don't always know why they come. We don't always know the reason or the purpose. But one thing we do know, many things we can gather from this, but that is the fact that God does love us, and God has a purpose and a plan, and he wants to work that out, and he wants to bring about his plan, but ultimately he wants to receive glory. Glory. Are we willing to allow him to have the glory? And in so doing, we must go through what he allows us to, and has for us to go through, and to have the right attitude going through that. Difficult, hard. We can do it in his power and his strength. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and what you did here in, this, in, in the lives of these individuals and those that believed on you as a result of what was brought to pass here. I pray, God, as we go through emergencies and difficulties, Lord, that you would bring your purposes and your plans and you would bring about what it is that you have in mind you'd be glorified. Help us, Lord, to have the right attitude. Help us, Lord, in our faith, knowing, Lord, that you are good, and you are good all the time, and all the time you are good. Lord, may you be glorified as we continue with the invitation, Pastor, I'll turn it over to you.
With heads bowed today, great message, great challenge regarding our faith, and perhaps you're going through some things today, and maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're angry, maybe you're discouraged, and maybe today God's just reminding you that He's doing all things for your good. And I wonder if you're here and you just say, hey, pastor, just pray for me. I'm going through some things, and boy, I need my faith to grow. Just pray for me. Would you slip your hand up so we can pray for you today? God bless you. Thanks. In a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation. And uh, when you stand or sit or if you need to come and pray, maybe you need to come pray with someone. Uh, Brother Phillip's available. I'm available. We'll have ladies here. If you're a lady and would like to pray with someone, talk with someone, we're happy to do that today. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, the truth is, uh, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, I would love to be able to, to know that someone's working on my behalf, someone's working that which is good for me. And I don't really have that relationship. I don't feel like I know God. I can talk to God. Truth is, Jesus came and lived and died so that you and I might live forever, so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could have eternal life, so that he could indwell us and be with us every day, every moment of every day. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, the truth is, Pastor, I don't know that I'd go to heaven one day. I don't know Christ is my Savior. That's a big need in my life. I have questions about that. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that? Just slip a hand up and put it right back down so we can remember to pray for you today. You know, if you have questions or you'd like to talk with someone about it, in a moment when we stand, we want to invite you to respond. And I hope and pray that you'll do that today. And Christians, just a great reminder. What we tend to think is often evil or neglectful or forgotten, actually God uses for our good. And uh, what a great message today. Let's stand for prayer. Can we do that? Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are good. And uh, Lord, thank you that our emergencies are important to you, but they're not um, so important that your plan, your purpose, what's absolutely best for us is overridden, and I'm grateful for that. Lord, all of us need to build our faith. All of us need to... uh, continue to learn and to grow so that we can go where you want us to go and do what you would have us to do. And so, Lord, help us the next time that we are struggling and find ourselves doubting and frustrated. Let us go back here to John 11. Let us remember that, Lord, what, what you do, you do for your honor and glory. You do out of a heart full of love. But, God, you do care about our struggles, our emergencies. You want to walk with us all along the way. But we know you're doing what you do for your honor and glory. And so, Lord, some folks raise hands today, but I know human nature and truth is, Lord, all of us struggle. And so the needs, the burdens, the paths we're walking, things we're experiencing, Lord, help us to be found faithful. Help our faith to grow in these times. And Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you as Savior, let today be the day that he or she would, Lord, put their faith and their trust in you come and talk with uh, someone here even before they leave today so that they might learn about the wonderful words of life. They might repent and believe. So, Lord, as we take a moment today during this invitation just to kind of reflect and search our own hearts, help us to be honest and help us to respond to your leading, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed. If you need to come, you come, you pray, you kneel there where you stand. Would you search your heart today? Would you Would you respond to God's leading? Would you ask God to help you and help your faith? If you need to come and pray with someone, you you do that today. We won't tarry long, but just give it a moment here while Ryan plays. Lord, I'm thankful that you are good. So, Lord, thank you for your word today. And I pray that, uh, Lord, it would uh, speak the words of truth and encouragement into us. And as we leave in a moment, uh, that 
will uh, take these truths, these principles, Lord, hold on to them fast. And maybe things are good right now, but we know the time will come uh, when we have that emergency. So, Lord, thank you that we can trust you. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. Forgive us that we ever doubt you. And so, Lord, uh, we just thank you for uh, what we've heard today. And so I pray that now, Lord, you would bless. And, uh, Lord, I pray as we uh, get ready to uh, say uh, goodbye uh, to the wilds, that, uh, Lord, they'll feel encouraged and loved today. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.